water. How's it going, everybody? It's Yeong here, and welcome to a Zelda Breath of the Wild news update. The following information comes from Game Informer's latest magazine issue, where they shared some exclusive new details of the game. Now, do keep in mind that there are minor spoilers here, particularly regarding one of the game's dungeons. If you want to be 100% surprised when you play the game, do not watch this video. But if you don't mind knowing one or two things, this information really isn't anything too major. It won't ruin the game by any means. But just keep that in mind and make your own judgment. So, before we get to the details about the dungeons, here are a couple of interesting details that Game Informer shared leading up to that information. Starting with NPCs. They mentioned how NPCs will actually react dynamically depending on the time of day and the weather. For example, Game Informer witnessed a rainstorm occurring while perusing one of the game's stables, and the NPC standing outside, they actually hastily started to make their way inside. And the article also noted little details like the traveling merchant, Beetle, covering his head while making his way inside. So that's pretty cool, just little details like that really sell a world and really immerse you into the game. And then they mentioned how rainstorms can evolve into thunderstorms, and when that happens, drawing your sword will draw lightning towards you. We kind of saw that in some of the footage, and it looks pretty scary, and in fact, Game Informer actually decided to test the boundaries of this just out of curiosities, and eventually, they actually got struck by lightning, and it killed Link instantly. So that's something to watch out for if you are swinging your sword around while there's a thunderstorm. The article then proceeded by talking about the world, and they emphasized that players can do whatever they want in this world. They can go straight to the final boss if they want to. They probably won't have enough power or stats to successfully achieve this, unless you're one of those crazy people who like to, I don't know, beat Dark Souls at level 1 fully naked or whatever, but... Through trial and error, players can determine for themselves when they think they're ready, when they think is the best chance to tackle the final boss, if that's what they want to do. So it's all up to you, which is awesome. And speaking of difficulties, Game Informer mentioned that there are some areas of the world that will be more difficult than others. And when you notice a difficulty spike while you're in an area, you can always just decide to leave and come back to it whenever you want. Again, it's all very open-ended. Game Informer then detailed their play session of Zelda Breath of the Wild, and one of the regions that they went to is the cold region of Hyrule, where they encountered a number of creatures. While exploring this area, they noticed things like animals and creatures, particularly things like bears, wolves, and deer, who were moving through the snow and whatnot. And there were also some more hostile creatures like the Ice Lizalfos, who can actually camouflage themselves with the snow and execute surprise attacks. So the enemies here in Breath of the Wild, they are actually more hazardous and more difficult than in past games. And the same thing applies to the game's general environment and setting. Enemies in particular, Game Informer noted, they will attack in groups and they will be quick to overwhelm players if they're not careful. Like with the player in this article, he was doing a one-on-one -on -one fight with an Ice Lizalfos and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, another one uncamouflaged and attacked him and it was a, all of a sudden a two versus one battle and the dude got owned. But the editor also found that these kinds of enemies might have elemental weaknesses. So the second time around, he came in with fire arrows, and that allowed the Game Informer editor to take the enemies down more easily. And for cold environments in general, the article warned that wearing the right clothes and eating spicy food helps a lot. And this is something that we saw in previous footage. One final detail for the cold environment, and this is really interesting and a neat little thing, is that if you kill enemies that drop meat within the cold area, the meat will actually freeze, so it'll appear as frozen meat, which you can then cook later. Moving on, the article then shifted to talking about horses. 
One of the first things that they noted was that instead of Epona joining the fray from the get-go, players will be finding and taming wild horses. The stronger the horse, the more difficult it'll be to tame. The article also mentioned that they crafted a sneaking elixir before attempting to tame a horse because you have to sneak behind it, and this elixir will apparently quiet Link's footsteps. It's also possible to take advantage of the weather for stealth. When it's raining, for example, the sound of Link's footsteps will be dampened. After taming a horse, Link can then register the horse and see its stats at a stable. And there you'll be able to see that some horses may be stronger than others when it comes to attacking enemies with their hooves, while others may have more stamina. So players can register multiple horses and switch between them at stables depending on what their goal is. If they're going for a more offensive, combat-centric goal, then maybe you want to take the horse with more power. But if you're planning for a long trip, maybe you want to take the horse with more stamina. The article also mentioned that things like affection and loyalty will come into play when it comes to raising your horses. Feeding and taking care of horses will increase their stats as time goes by. And the most loyal horses will actually automatically follow Link wherever he goes without the need of much guidance. Whereas with horses that are not as loyal, you'll probably have to call them manually more often. And when you do call them manually, something you have to note is that you have to be within a certain proximity of the horse to do that. You can't just call a horse from the other side of the map like you can in a game like Witcher 3. So you don't want to leave your horse behind, that's for sure. Now, horses aren't just taken advantage by the player and Link. There's actually a point in the play session where the Game Informer editor gets attacked by enemies on horseback. There's actually a screenshot showing a bokoblin on a horse, and these types of enemies exist in Breath of the Wild. And one of the things you can do while battling them is if you hit them the right way, you can knock them off the horse and then take the battle to the ground. You want to be careful though, because if horses get attacked too much or take too much damage, they can actually die, which is exactly what happened to Link's horse during Game Informer's play session. And once they die, there's no way to revive them, or at least nothing that showed within this particular play session. So you want to be careful if there is a horse that you value and there is a huge battle taking place, you might want to keep them away and alive. So that's it for horses, the topic then shifted to companions. So characters like Navi, Midna, and Fai would fall within that category. According to Aonuma, Link in this game will for the most part be a lone wolf, as Aonuma wanted players to forge their own path without being constantly distracted by companions. And this is a move that I can definitely appreciate. These companions always felt like Nintendo's way of holding our hands through the whole experience, and it was just, it got a little annoying at times. Now we can just do whatever we want. We might get a few suggestions from Zelda's voice here and there from time to time, but for the most part, we're gonna be lone wolf, we're gonna be able to do whatever we want, and we're not gonna be pestered constantly. Thank God. Then, the article talked a bit about upgrading Link, particularly the stamina gauge, and according to Nintendo, you can actually upgrade Link's stamina throughout the game. And the stamina gauge, of course, determines how long Link can sprint, climb, paraglide, etc. Although, details on how to upgrade stamina wasn't provided. That's something we're gonna have to find out when the game launches. So then, Game Informer continued talking about their play session, and at one point, while exploring the world, they found a conspicuous rock that yielded minerals after they smashed it with a hammer. And apparently these minerals can be sold for rupees or be used for crafting, an element that they didn't really cover during their play session and something that Nintendo kept mum about. But it looks like there will be some kind of weapons or armor crafting system in this game and you'll be using minerals for that. Then, during their play session, they eventually came upon nighttime, and different enemies appeared at that time, like in past Zelda games. As is traditional in Zelda games, the enemies that appeared at night were skeletons, but these ones in particular were giant skeletons, most likely giant Stalfos. And these skeletons, they were essentially a lot like traditional Stalfos. You smack them around and they eventually fall apart after taking enough damage. But if you want to finish them out right, you have to go for the head. You have to destroy the head before they can put themselves back together. 
And they also noted that when these giant style foes do fall apart, you can pick up their arm and use that as a weapon, which is hilarious. Something else that Game Informer discovered during their play session is that if you bring up the world map, you can actually label points of interest with stamps. And from what they saw, available symbols included a sword, shield, bow and arrow, pot, star, chest, skull, leaf and diamond. And up to 100 of these stamps in any combination can be placed throughout the map at the player's leisure so that they can choose to mark important points that they want to come back to or to remind them of something. The map starts out fairly sparse according to Game Informer, but then it fills up as Link activates Sheikah Towers. And if you've been keeping up with Breath of the Wild news and footage, you've seen this. In an Assassin's Creed-like fashion, reaching and activating these Sheikah Towers will reveal a detailed map of the tower's nearby area and terrain. So you definitely want to go for those towers when you have the time. All right, so with all that out of the way, let's finally dive into details regarding dungeons. And here is my last minor spoilers warning for you guys before I proceed. If you want to be 100% surprised, don't watch this video anymore, but if you don't mind a few details here and there that really won't ruin the game, then you can keep watching and if you feel like I'm getting too spoilery, just X out the video, keep that mouse at the ready. So anyway, here we go. So at one point during Game Informer's play session, Nintendo just loaded up the dungeon on a save file, so there were no clues that were provided in regards to how to reach that dungeon. Now, one mysterious hint that Nintendo offered is that this particular dungeon is constantly moving and that to solve its many physics-based traps and puzzles, Link has to manipulate the entire enormous mechanism that is this dungeon through his own ingenuity. More on this later. In general, Breath of the Wild's dungeons will be able to be tackled in any order. You can skip them outright if you want and head straight towards Calamity Ganon if you so desire, although this could mean you'd miss out on important story details and gameplay elements. I mean, why would you not want to go through all the dungeons? But again, you have that choice. And I'm not sure if you'll be able to actually beat the final boss first and then do the dungeons, that'd be really interesting. But I think Nintendo is leaving it as open-ended as possible. They've been constantly reiterating that. But yeah, Breath of the Wild dungeons, any order you want. Now the particular dungeon that Game Informer was taken to was covered by the scatterings of a substance called Malice, and touching it would hurt Link. But these clusters of Malice could be destroyed by finding the eyeball, as Game Informer described it, and killing this eyeball. So one example that they gave is that there is one pool of malice where there was a mouth that spewed out bombs and you had to kill it to get rid of that pool of malice. Then they dived into further detail and from their description, it looks like this dungeon was themed on wind, featuring air vents and the like. My personal theory is that this dungeon might be that giant airship we saw in one of the more recent trailers. I think that whole ship is actually a dungeon and it looks wind based and this dungeon sounds wind themed and if you put one and two together, it's certainly possible, I would even say likely. So as Game Informer progressed further into the dungeon, something that they discovered is that in this game you won't be finding physical maps and treasure chests. Instead, you'll find a node where you can insert your Sheikah Slate to obtain a 3D map of the dungeon. Now, what's really cool about this dungeon is that it implements the map into the dungeon's physics-based puzzles. The way Game Informer put it was, the map is a 3D model and players have the option to tilt the entire dungeon from here. Doing so slides blocks into place and opens up angles you can use to paraglide to new locations. They also provided specific scenarios where this mechanic came to play, stating the following. The locations are marked on the 3D map and I make my way to each while solving puzzles along the way. One involves standing on a block and tilting the dungeon so I can grab a ladder as the block slides by. Another involves placing a bomb in a room Link can't access himself and tilting the dungeon so the bomb rolls towards a destructible wall. Using a switch to open up an air vent finishes the bomb's roll towards its goal. That definitely sounds cool as hell. Something else that's interesting about this dungeon is that, according to Game Informer, a friendly voice will occasionally guide Link, 
The source of this voice was not revealed, but it's probably one of the important voiced NPCs of this game, of which there are several. So after talking about the dungeon some more, they eventually dived into Eiji Anuma's philosophy for dungeons in Breath of the Wild, and in general, it looks like they won't be as massive as some of the ones you find in games like Twilight Princess and Skyward Sword. They won't be these huge mazes. According to Game Informer's article, Nintendo took a simpler approach to dungeons for Breath of the Wild. The editor also noted that the dungeon they played was smaller and less confusing overall. Anuma's quote on the matter goes as follows. Way back in the day, dungeons weren't all that big. They were rather small, but around Twilight Princess, they started getting bigger. We tried to cram in a lot of surprises for the player, or a lot of emotions, meeting other characters, or injecting story elements into it. But then we kind of realized, do dungeons really need to be that big? Do we have to cram that much stuff into it? We quickly realized that a lot of the fun was actually getting to the dungeon, and so we focused on getting to the dungeon in this game. We wanted to create an environment where it is fun to find the dungeon in this large world. Game Informer also noted that while a few chests in the dungeon that they played offered items like ammunition, ice arrows in particular, none of them had the iconic chest opening animation and signature musical flourish. There was also no unique items or compass to be found anywhere. That 3D map that they essentially downloaded onto the Sheikah Slate was all they had to guide them through the dungeon, and that wasn't even found in a chest. That was downloaded through the Sheikah Slate node or whatever you want to call it. So yeah, that's the general gist of dungeons in Zelda Breath of the Wild. The article then proceeded by talking about the boss that greeted the player. The boss of this particular dungeon is called Wind Blight Ganon. It was noted that while Calamity Ganon is the ultimate evil that Link must defeat, there are also other bosses and enemies in the game that represent the manifestation of Calamity Ganon's evil. The article then reported that, at one point, the dungeon's mysterious friendly voice said to Link, it's one of Ganon's own, it plays dirty. And then, combat started, and a life meter appeared above the boss's name as an overlay. Now, you would expect that there's some kind of step one, step two, step three to defeating this boss, but... This is another way that Breath of the Wild is breaking convention. When it comes to defeating this boss, since the player didn't find any unique items, they just had to rely on Link's normal combat skills. So it seems as though Breath of the Wild will not feature many of the logic-based, step-by-step boss battles we have come to know from past games. This is definitely a departure from that formula. While there are certain weaknesses to exploit that will allow you to better engage the enemy, it looks like Breath of the Wild is aiming to be much more open-ended when it comes to the methodology of defeating bosses. Now, for the sake of not spoiling the boss battle completely, I won't detail exactly how Game Informer defeated it. You can go ahead and check out their magazine issue for that if you so desire. All I'll say is that again, there weren't any specific steps behind killing it. The player simply tried a variety of things, exploited a few weaknesses, and then just plowed their way through. I'm definitely getting some mixed feelings from this notion that bosses and dungeons in this game are no longer logic-based, but at the same time, I'm excited about the prospect of solving these very intricate, epic, large-scale, physics-based puzzles, and defeating open-ended bosses where I can choose and discover various methodologies. It almost feels like Nintendo is finally ready to let go of players' hands and just have them figure shit out with very little guidance and just kind of forge their own path, which is exciting. I will probably miss some of the traditional Zelda formulas, but alas, the series has to evolve at some point, and I'm happy and excited to see that Nintendo is trying something very different, very untraditional, and very outside the typical formula. It's risky, sure, but this might end up being a worthwhile evolution that will push the series to new heights. We'll have to wait and see what happens, but I'm also excited to try this out.
The final topic that Game Informer's article addressed was weapons in Zelda Breath of the Wild. According to Nintendo, nearly every enemy drops their weapon, and Link can pick them up if the player chooses to. Link can also come across these weapons by exploring the world. It's an approach that is closer to the modern-day role-playing games than your traditional Zelda. Game Informer also noted how every weapon type, whether it be the sword, the axe, the club, or the mop, you can actually find a mop in this game, they all will have different animations and attack patterns, and they will all essentially feel distinct from one another. And also, depending on the stats, certain weapons will vary in power, speed, and rate of deterioration. Weapons might also have varying properties depending on their material, so metallic weapons will draw lightning during thunderstorms, while wooden weapons will burn with fire. The last mystery to the weapon system puzzle is crafting, but again, Nintendo remained mum about this mechanic. Finally, Nintendo confirmed that there are no invincible weapons in this game, they all break at one point. Which makes me all the more curious to find out what the role of the Master Sword is in Breath of the Wild. I don't think the Master Sword would break, that'd be ridiculous, it's the Sword of Evil's Bane. But there might be some kind of mechanic behind it. Maybe it can only be used in specific sections of the game, or maybe it can only be used for a limited amount of time before it loses its power and has to be recharged or something. Or perhaps it's the game's ultimate reward and there are certain conditions that have to be met to obtain this ultimate weapon that maybe is the only one that doesn't break. I don't know, we'll find out when the game launches. So that about summarizes all the important and relevant bits of information regarding Zelda Breath of the Wild that yielded from Game Informer's latest issue. So with that, I would like to end this news update. Thank you for tuning in. Let us know in the comments below what you think about the new approach to puzzles, dungeons, and bosses in Zelda Breath of the Wild. And to be further updated on all things Zelda Breath of the Wild, stay tuned right here on Young Yeah. I'll see you guys next time. Young out. <laughs>